thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Welcome to the second of our seminars on using FOI for advocacy and campaigning. Um, the recording of our first seminar on getting the most from FOI is available on our YouTube channel at the moment, and we will be recording this seminar as well, so we can send it to you afterwards and also use clips from the recording for other training courses. Um, today, we're here because we're going to delve into telling stories using FOI data, and we're going to hear from three speakers who use FOI in their work in different ways. As usual on these seminars, we'd ask you to stay on mute throughout the presentations, and there will be a chance to ask questions in a Q&A after each presentation. Um, we'll have a break after CUK have presented, um, just for 10 minutes, um, so you can nip to the loo, and you can always pop questions in the chat as well, and myself and my colleagues can answer or bring these up for you. Um, so, with no further ado, our first presentation is from Ilya, Programme Director and Senior Legal Officer at Privacy International. Ilya is going to be talking to us about using FOI in advocacy and campaigning work. Go ahead. Thank you very, very much. Um, the magic moment again. Can you see my screen? Yes. Oh, brilliant. Okay, hello everyone, and thank you very, very much for um, having a PI uh, today here. Um, uh, my, uh, what do they know? And uh, my study have been instrumental in a lot of the work I've been presenting here. They've managed to put uh, order in our chaos, so I'm very, very glad to be here with you today. Um, just a brief introduction. Um, it doesn't seem one second. Okay, there it is. Um, for just for who Privacy International is, Privacy International is a London-based uh, uh, charity that uh, works globally with partners, and uh, we research and advocate globally against government and corporate abuses of data and technology. We've been around uh, for quite a little while. Um, I am with PI for almost six years now. I am a lawyer and I'm leading one of our strategic areas uh, at uh, Privacy International. And uh, throughout our work, we have been using at different stages freedom information requests to inform our advocacy and campaigning. And I'm just going to present a couple of uh, these today and how it has worked for us. Um, so in the next few minutes, I will um, specifically talk about how we've been using POIA in our work. As a first, uh, our aim today is just to share this experience and a little bit of, of how we went about it quite uh, quite a few times it has been trial and error and try again. So um, this is a persistence. So the first uh, part, I will just speak about FOIA as a source of information in campaigns. And then uh, how we, on the second part, how we've used information to push for policy change. And I'll bring two examples. Then I will look into um, what happens when they refuse to provide information and how one can turn this around, sometimes successfully, sometimes less so, and then some just uh, some final thoughts. So going um, first to, to my first um, example, uh, we have been using consistently for many, many years now freedom information requests as a software of information that then it feeds into our campaigns um, and advocacy strategies. And actually, it has been, um, we've, we've made, submitted the first uh, set of FOIA, and then we would go for a second round informed by the first one, and that built our favorite works. A key example we, we often bring is our Neighborhood Watch campaign together with uh, Liberty. We had started in 2016 where we submitted freedom information requests to um, many uh, to different police forces across the UK in order to uh, and the 
the what we were looking for was investigating on how uh surveillance technologies has been used at local level by law enforcement and trying to identify the different technologies um, that has been there. Um, we've submitted for, uh, for your request, as I said, and we were able to identify several different technologies that have been used by the police forces, including body-worn cameras, uh, predictive policing tools, social media intelligence as a tool, facial recognition, hacking, mobile phone extraction, and others. And that's, uh, that's this information we received is what inspired the Neighborhood Watch campaign and what brought it together, because we realized that actually there was hardly any transparency with regard to the procurement and use of this technology by law enforcement, we realized that there was a massive regulatory gap because actually the technologies were introduced before um, any uh, guidance quite often was put in place. And this is how we uh, started this campaign. And um, a key element in this campaign was actually to motivate, uh, what we wanted was for local communities to be able to be informed about police using technologies and to be able to scrutinize that. And so we were calling for more transparency and while, and the ability to submit freedom of information requests was, was what inspired our call for action, which to action, which was asking everyone to write to their local police and crime commissioner, asking for more information and asking for better regulation. Um, it's, it's been, a, it's, we've launched this campaign in 2019, but actually it has been the basis on which we actually, um, started our next campaign that focused more on the use of the same technologies in front of, uh, in protests. And in this campaign, we were, um, what we wanted to do is provide a guide for protesters where they are informed about the different um, surveillance technologies used and provide some guidance with regard to what steps protesters can take to mitigate some of the exposure. Um, but, and, but what was probably the biggest uh, like outcome from um, this round of freedom information requests was using this information and amplifying it uh, to um, with regard to our advocacy and campaigning in relation to specific technologies. So these were kind of looking at the broader view and and the overarching. Um, so the first one was the um, use uh, um, of information we received with regard to mobile phone extraction is one of um, our most, uh, at the technologies we have looked uh, and we have been working on uh, in depth. We are referring to with mobile phone extraction to the ability of the police to use um, tools that can extract all the information um, from a mobile phone. Uh, and that can be, depending on the technology, it can be done with or without, um, or by bypassing the pass, passport information. So this work is still ongoing in many uh, ways. This was from the Neighborhood Watch campaign, but then um, what we did was in 2016, we submitted a FOIA request to 47 UK police stations, asking them for information. Uh, we then published a report, which I will come back to it, uh, on digital stop and search and how the police uh, can uh, can be used. Because from our FOIA request, it became clear that mobile phone extraction was something that started being regularly used in stop and search. Um, and from their responses, we were all, all, also able to see that actually there wasn't a clear legal framework around the use of mobile phone extraction tools um, by the police forces. Uh, we then used this information to submit a complaint to the um, 
ICO to the Data Protection Authority, and they actually initiated an investigation in 2020. They published a report criticizing um, the UK police for the way in which they were talking about um, taking data from people's phones, uh, including victims of crimes. And the report called for reform and safeguards so that uh, people's data and privacy is not is protected from unnecessarily intru uh, intrusive practices such as mobile phone extraction. And this was in, in, a, in a setting where we do recognize at a certain point they do need to use these uh, powers, but how and when is what we were um, we were considering. Um, and then we are continuing this work with, by narrowing it down even more to a setting which is um, migration. Uh, there has been several reportings from migration groups about asylum seekers reaching the UK borders um, to uh, and and seeking for asylum, and the uh, police forces were actually extracting all the data from their phones, and again we've in the we were called in this. Um, there, there's been litigation in it, and we were called as expert witnesses, and we used the information we had from the FOIA request to inform um, these uh, witness statements. So we have been using the freedom information requests to actually inform the statistical numbers. Um, for instance, with the mobile phone extraction, where from the 47 police forces, we real we've were able to uh, detect that 55% of them had admitted using such technologies. Um, and from those, we, from their answers with regard to the legal basis, it was clear to us that they had no clue what were they were talking about. And then out of the remaining 21 police um, forces, uh, 17% had trialed it and 28% they either failed to respond or didn't recognize. So in this way, we were able to show that their use was widespread, it was persisting, and make the point that actually the legal framework was not there. Uh, we did a similar thing for social media uh, monitoring. We had submitted with regard to FOIA requests in the past with law enforcement. Uh, and social media uh, monitoring, we are referring both um, to just going online and looking at someone's public profile, but then also actually um, covert methods that uh, where the police could, might create a fake profile. What we were interested in here is to understanding the overt. So uh, going into someone's Facebook profiles, and it is our view that when law enforcement or other local authorities are actually systematically collecting information from, from people's profiles and they save this information and they are using for decision making later. This is not uh, public, this goes beyond uh, the reasonable expectation of users on why they post this information and needs to be properly regulated. And so we've went even bigger um, so in October 2019, we submitted um, freedom information requests to every local authority in Great Whitman, 251 of those. And um, we asked them whether they had conducted, uh, whether they were using social media monitoring, how they were using it, and um, further information, it's all information is public, uh, both on our website and on my society's website. Um, and you can find it there. And so from this 251, uh, we re we've received 136 responses and we use this as the basis for, um, um, for um, analyzing and reaching conclusions. And, what was again staggering was a 
2.5 percent of the of the responses said that I guess they were using um social media monitoring and uh, the first thing finding was actually exactly that yes they were using it and it was they were using much more actually going to someone's social media profile and much more than covert social media monitoring um and so then our further then we had further findings where apparently I deleted finding three, I will reintroduce it. Um, we've found that over to some, uh, the second finding was that all the local authorities that responded, yes, that they were using it, that they consider it for a game, and that if the users were not applying good privacy settings, then it's, it's their fault. Um, and then uh, we further found that um, there was actually no guidance with regards to how this information is used or whether there was actually any cross, any scrutiny over the information that we're extracting and, and any possibility to challenge this information. And then finally, we found that they were using it for a wide a wide array of purposes, and that could actually have a serious impact on their decision making. Um, in similar terms, we used um, and sorry, just to finish there, we have been bringing this into uh, advocacy for stronger regulation and into litigation, where again we have submitted expert witness statements. And uh, we are continuing this work, also bringing it to other jurisdictions. Um, and then I have, think I have a few minutes left. Please let me know if, if I need to stop. <laughs> uh, bringing to the third part of my presentation where it's, it's more looking into turning a refusal to advocacy and this uh, concerns particularly um, my nemesis, which is IMSI catchers. These are um, this is technology that basically fakes a mobile phone tower and tricks a mobile phone to connect first to that tower and then to a real mobile phone tower. And in that way, actually, the police can collect um, the uh, IMSI number of uh, your phone which is actually unique to each phone connect and they can identify who was uh, at a specific location, specific time. And they have uh, neither confirmed nor denied that, but uh, uh, there are uh, there have been uh, public information with regards to the, the extensive use of these tools in protest situations. So we send our FOIA requests, we asked for this information, and um, we received 18 responses, and they all responded in the same manner. They can neither confirm nor deny that uh, they uh, held information with regard to bar requests, and bar request was asking, have you, do you have in Zikasser? Have you used it? Have you trialed it? It was the same type of freedom information request that was submitted for mobile phone extraction. But here we received a very loud no and a very consistent no, um, which was a completely different like outcome compared to the mobile phone extraction one. Um, so there, we were expecting, We, I mean, the public information was out of a Bristol cable disclosure uh, of documents that demonstrated that they were used. And that's how we were motivated to submit our own requests. And here we, we've used it. It was already built in our strategy. We were expecting them to say no, uh, maybe not that consistently, but uh, so the plan was to actually submit um, a complaint to the ICO and challenge that decision. And what we were probably not expecting was that actually the ICO upheld um, the NCND 
And so when we appealed the ISO decision, also the Information Rights Tribunal upheld uh, the previous decision and so denied our request to appeal. And this is where we've decided that actually it was time to, spot, to stop uh, with that process and bringing back to just advocacy and continue um, to, to, to follow a different approach. So we used the same information and we went to uh, the NPCC, uh, the uh, mayor of London, the, uh, of London Office for Policing and Crime and the Investigator Buyers Commission's office. And we've sent them letters saying, it is, there is public information that points to that every other like every other country that uses the moment I have been public about it. We don't understand the reason. Um, and all three of them responded, we don't know. We 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 it's a precedent. We agree with the precedent. We are not gonna, we are neither conf gonna confirm nor deny. But still, they gave some answers with regard to if they were going to use IMSI catchers. Well, this is the legal basis, the, th the legal framework, the thing that would apply to it, which was very interesting because they didn't agree with each other. And that also showed that actually there is an inconsistently with regard to what they consider would be the legal framework that would govern that technology. And also there was inconsistency with regard to whether they considered this a generalized and indiscriminate type of surveillance, because once an image catchers operate, the police cannot target one phone. They will just catch everything. Um, and I mean, we haven't won this one, but we're going to continue and see where we get. Um, and it's not the only one we haven't won. Um, we had the same with whether uh, the home office is meeting with companies um, with regard to breaking encryption safeguards. They've said no to that, but we've sent a new one and we are trying again. But then also the other thing that um, the example I had from was from um, EU institution was what was very interesting was also to to see what you do with information that it's not there. So for instance, we've submitted uh, freedom of information requests asking for information with regard to the selling of technologies to other countries and what measures they've been taking while doing that. There was no reference to risk assessments in this process. And so there was, so we took that and turned it into an advocacy and a complaint um, strategy. I think I'll stop here. Um, we, I just wanted to bring um, also to your attention that we we have a FOIA guide also with tips with regard to specific to surveillance technologies and lessons learned. I think my our favorite is when we were um, called vexatious for submitting a second round of FOIA requests for mobile phone extraction. Um, so this is something to keep in mind and, um, I'll stop here looking forward to hearing, um, what the others have to bring and, uh, also to your questions. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Ilya. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or, uh, drop anything into the chat if you want one of the My Society folks to raise the question for you instead. Um, so we've probably got about five or 10 minutes for questions before we move on to Isaac's presentation. We will, if you raise your hand, we'll be able to unmute you. What was the third finding? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that third finding? I will re-add it, but it was what I said about the lack of actually any uh, audit or guidance with regard to how they were, uh, how they were scrutinizing this information. Um, and um, 
I mean, it's exactly about the fact that then they were using this information as a matter of fact to take to make key decisions for uh, people's livelihood. Um, so, but I will add it and reshare it uh, <laughs> with you. Promise. Um, I have a a question which was um just about when you get rejections at any level so whether it's originally from the public body that you're asking whether it's from the ICO or even at that tribunal level is there a way to make that rejection into the story yes um so I mean it really depends on uh what you want to do with it with the IMSI catchers we've been trying to that to do that but it kind of is used also against us in a way that this has become the precedent now. So it's something we are also considering every step of the way, whether and to what extent we want to push further when we refuse, re receive a refusal. And uh, there we've received refusals where we've decided not to, to challenge it in a way because we didn't want to have a more public, like a, a set decision on the matter. And we've tried to resubmit it by sending a different type set of questions. Um, but uh, I think, yes, absolutely. Um, it can turn into, um, into a story, especially when there is also other public information with regard to, um, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna use the IMSI catchers again as an example, because it comes back to mind. Uh, but there, exactly, they neither confirmed nor denied, but that didn't prevent us for actually keep pushing that and bringing it to other fora as well, and to um, explain why we've decided not to move forward with next steps. I'm a lawyer, so of course my brain is going to be uh, on, on the lawyer side of the advocacy points, but then our campaigning uh, team would be also then using that to to further demonstrate together with other information on how um, there's been a wide use. Uh, and then also to bring uh, that refusal to maybe the subsequent requests as well. Amazing. Thank you so much. Maya has a question here. She's asked, one of your top tips is format matters. Could you say any more about the format or the best pointers for the yes. formats, please? So uh, in our experience, the authority's initial instinct could be to find a way to give you the least information possible. So the way the question and the way they most likely are going to do that is by using the way you formatted the question, we formatted the question to actually minimize the amount of information they would be sharing. So it's quite often very useful to have a yes or no question. It might seem as a, a, like a waste of a question, but actually that's takes a moment to answer, and then you have that key piece of information. Another thing we've noticed is sometimes it's very useful not only to ask about like explicit question where they need to fit the information, but also to ask for documents. And then it might take less time for them to answer, but then the documents will contain much more information if they're willing to share. Um, there is always the question. And then Um, I had a third thing in mind. And then also quite often one thing they will bring back is suggesting that the request is too broad and we need to narrow it down. And that would be part of the way we like, it can be part of the strategy to lock them into having to respond to the freedom of information requests by asking you to narrow it down and then um, you narrow it down further uh, and then they will have to respond to that. 
Amazing. Um, there was another question from Alex, but I think that might have already been answered. Alex, are you happy with the answer that you've had in the chat or would you like me to ask it? I think I'm happy, thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, in that case, I think I'm going to pass over to Isaac. Isaac is here from CUK. He is the Partnerships Director at CUK, and he is going to be talking about finding the data in stories. Uh, finding the stories in data, sorry, the data in stories. Getting my words all mixed up today. Um, yeah, finding the stories in data and talking about their scorecards work. do the classic, uh, unmute myself before I start speaking, <laughs> Zoom trick. Um, yeah, uh, thanks, Jen, for having us. Um, really appreciate it. I also saw, uh, Ilya, that in the chat, someone said you had some of the best slides ever. I probably don't have some of the best slides ever, so I do apologise. It was a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, so yeah, finding the stories in, in data, um, Climate CK. Um, just want to say a big shout out to my society. Uh, what do they know is like such a, an amazing tool to use and um, so easy as well. And, and we used it. I explained how we used it, but yeah, just wanted to start with that because it's really important to thank the uh, the platform and, and shoulders of the people you're standing on effectively to do the work that you can. So yeah, it's really important. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about who Climates UK are and what we do. We founded about, just about five years ago now. Um, we um, first collated uh, data and information on the climate emergency declarations that councils, so like UK local authorities, uh, declared, and then worked with my society to create the Climate Action Plan Explorer. Um, so that uh, detailed all the action plans that they then declared, um, that they then, um, sorry, created. We then worked to create the Council Climate Plan Scorecards, which we published in January 2022, and that was the first ever UK-wide assessment of all Council Climate Plans. And then we have um, obviously started marking and then published the climate Council Climate Action Scorecards, which was the first UK-wide assessment of all local UK local authorities' climate action. So we started that marking in January 2023, and we published it in October um, 2023. And kind of our mission, which is at the bottom, is equipping the council climate movement with the information and guidance needed for structural change and, and um, supporting local campaigns to push for more climate action. That's So that's just a really brief overview of, of who we are. Um, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about our kind of our work with freedom of information and requests. So as part of the council climate action scorecards, we actually sent around 4,000 FOIs to UK local authorities. Um, so the idea of being vexatious is something, yeah, that can be a little borderline. Um, we sent that those inf those freedom of information requests based on the information that we think we weren't able to get. Um, you know, we compiled data on staffing levels for on climate change. So we asked about how many you know climate staff they have or how many staff they have that's implementing their climate plan. We asked about whether they have planning ecologists to um, implement biodiversity net gain or BNG as the acronym is. Um, we asked about the average EPC ratings of council homes and their enforcement of um, energy efficiency under the MEES law, the minimum energy efficiency standard they have in local authorities. And then we also asked about things like carbon literacy training of councillors and their management and the council's lobbying of the national government as well. So we actually were asking them whether they had um, lobbied um, the UK or then devolved government for further funding around or further funding or powers around climate. So we were looking um, for lots of data in, in, in across every part of the local authorities function and um, asking, but asking really specific questions uh, kind of to, to do that. So something that Ilya pointed out that it's really important for FOIs that if you're specific, then you're going to get the, the correct answer back. So we were asking for a broad range of data, but we were asking for it for, in really specific ways. Um, what I'm, I'm going to do this a bit back to front. So what was quite exciting was we had an exclusive with the fa Financial Times as part of this work, which was really, really cool. And um, uh, we were actually on page two in the print version, which was also really cool um, as well. But we had uh, this um, online article, which you can see here. So our work asking around the average EPC ratings or for social housing or council homes across the UK, that was what we managed to get an exclusive with the Financial Times with. And we're a very small organisation. 
Um, we've managed to punch above our weight a little bit in terms of the press we've, we've been able to get and garner. And, and so for us, that's like really exciting. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we actually managed to achieve that and, and how we thought about it and, and yeah, managed to do it um, from ourselves. So it's not out of the realms of possibility for anyone here or on any of their campaigns to be able to do it because there's nothing that's particularly special that we were able to do um, at Climates UK. We just kind of followed some what we thought were logical steps to be able to get this. So, yeah. Um, so that was the end result. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we what we did. So just before that, we actually pitched three stories um, to the journalists at the FT. So obviously the most important thing is to get contact with some kind of journalist at a national newspaper. That's like the most obvious thing to do. And then we pitched them three stories. And what what I did what we did in in writing those stories is to kind of pitch them the background to each of those stories, but also a headline so they could kind of imagine the piece so that they would be able to understand the framing of the piece as well. Well, and it also gives you some input into what the framing of the piece might be like. Um, so, uh, for example, biodiversity net gain implementation will be a postcode lottery. So that's like, you know, one of the big government flagship policies. I'll talk a little bit about how we why we pick these stories and why we chose these. Residents in council homes may be paying more for their bills, obviously focusing around like the energy efficiency angle and um, the cost of living crisis. And then, yeah, councils lobby the UK government for further powers for climate action. So these are we picked because we had such a broad range of data and, and different um, data sets. We we've actually pitched three stories. So don't be afraid to go. You know, we've got all of these data sets. Here's like some of the key stories that we have. It, it, it gives the journalists a choice to be like, oh, OK, actually, this one I think is going to be the best for us or the most relevant for us. So don't be afraid to pitch multiple stories at, at the same time or potential stories um we found this this may be really obvious but we found the story by analyzing our data and looking at trends um obviously we had you know we were sending um freedom of information requests across to uh and receiving thousands of responses and then we looked at all of those freedom of information requests and we just analyzed the trends you know many councils did not have planning ecologists to enforce biodiversity net gain there was a huge disparity in the average epc ratings of council homes so one council had only two percent of its council homes at EPCC or above, which is roughly a good energy efficiency standard. Some councils had over 97% or 99% of council homes at EPCC or above. So that was the kind of um, trends that we were able to see that there was a huge disparity in the way um, people in different areas of the country that lived in council housing had and, um, levels of energy efficiency. And we obviously, that was the key story that got published um, but we also worked on things, you know, around the fact that biodiversity net gain was going to be implemented in a, in a kind of haphazard way because councils didn't have the necessary staffing requirements to implement that big national um, staffing policy. So obviously we just analysed our data and looked at it. Um, and that's like one of the first key things as well. Um, uh, probably pretty obvious. Why we pitched these stories, though, is because of their relevance to what was happening at the national um, in the national landscape in the news at the time. So that's like the key thing to think about from a journalist perspective from or from what we thought was that these stories that we picked from our data sets were at that moment. Um, about to be either a flagship national government policy was about to be um become statutory in november it obviously got pushed to february this year so we thought like data we had on um the fact that the implementation of that flagship policy was going to be haphazard was really relevant at the time so something that might pique a journalist's interest to be like okay i can write a story like this Obviously, one of the most obvious ones was the cost of living crisis and the fact that people that live in social housing or council homes may be therefore paying more in bills because of the lack, you know, poor energy efficiency standards. That's also like massively relevant at the time. So we thought that's why we picked um, those like headline, those two stories in particular out of the three, because um out of all the stories we potentially had was because it was really relevant to the the news from the day and uh and that's probably why um there was no interest in um uh some ways in in the council's lobby government for further powers um is um just because that kind of uh th ask has been made before um 
you know the data we had on biodiversity net gain and the fact that we the stuff around epc ratings of council homes that never been compiled before and obviously the relevancy with the key uh, national policies or key um issues at the time you know that data hadn't been compiled so it was kind of new it was fresh it could be viewed as exciting if you're in that this kind of world and really important as well because you know um from social justice angles or from nature um nature implementation of nature policies but councils lobbying the government for further power to climate action when we looking back actually when I was preparing this presentation I was like yeah of course a journalist isn't going to be interested in that particular story because they always ask for more feather powers for some kind of funding or climate action and you can see even from the LG this is an LGA press release at the bottom you know that's exactly what they ask at pretty much every given opportunity so the fact that they had asked it for um climate wasn't particularly relevant or interesting at the time so um, it wasn't surprising that, that that you know it wasn't picked as a story just to further like uh, pick uh, like go into the relevancy and, and why <clears throat> that was uh, like just such a big thing is we obviously combined the trends of the relevancy when we pitched the story so the trend in the data was councils not having plan ecologists to enforce biodiversity net gain that relevancy as i already mentioned was biodiversity net gain was about to come to mandatory it was a flagship policy of the government therefore we kind of created this story around or get pitched a headline of you know biodiversity net gain implementation will be a postcode lottery and um, that was the kind of like headline of thought we thought would um make it uh be become interesting to a journalist the trend in the data and the average epc ratings as i've mentioned there was huge disparity in the average epc ratings of social housing council homes there was a national policy on this government target for social housing to decarbonize by 2030 now 2035 really funny we already had the story in the exclusive confirmed rishi sunak managed to make the uh change to from 2030 to 2035 about three days before which probably pushed our story onto page two <laughs> so in that sense we were we were helped by the government being really terrible and um, obviously we didn't want that to happen um but it kind of added an extra flavor to the piece and they was the ft was something like yeah this is like really um like relevant and current at the, at the moment even though they were already committed to publishing it and, and going to publish it obviously like when i put news and life there's that whole pressure around bill skyrocketing skyrocketing and, and that relevancy and just social uh, social awareness of the issues around energy efficiency as well and and higher awareness in in general from the media energy efficiency is not traditionally a sexy topic but because of campaigns like insulate britain and and other um campaigns that have been going on around and the fact that you know the cost of living crisis that journalists were much more ready to uh, to print stories around energy efficiency because they thought it was an important topic at that time so kind of all of those um things like kind of helped us and so that's why we initially pitched that headline around you know residents maybe paying more for their council bills we obviously when we pitched those headlines also gave background information so that the journalists could be like okay i understand like what you're trying to get at here with the story because the, what they went forward for was councils are missing targets or the government's missing targets um based around energy efficiency as well so that's kind of um, we combined that training the data, looked at what was relevant and then pitched that story in the headline to the, to the journalist. Um, what you think may be interesting may not interest a journalist. I was really keen to go biodiversity net gain. I thought this was a really incredible story that we'd like unearthed not not interested at all <laughs> no interest in it wasn't particularly didn't even like talk about oh yeah this could be useful or maybe we'd print something else on this like just disregarded it completely and that was a, a slight uh <laughs> slightly painful for myself because uh, i thought this was like a super interesting story and going to be super relevant and you know i was really keen so what you think may be interesting um may as i said may not interest a journalist the other key thing is how you're framing a story may not be the framing that a journalist wants to take or thinks is important either so it, <clears throat> it's important not to be too um uh what's that word uh like it's important not to be uh it's important to give the journalist basically the freedom of, of how they want to frame and pitch the story it's not up to you and like you shouldn't be upset or anything if, if a journalist chooses a different framing or wants to emphasize something else in their story um the important thing is is that you you kind of influence that framing maybe at the start that you influence the um understanding and, and able to um give a clear um basis for the journalist to be able to write their story so they understand the data and what the data is saying and then you let them you know kind of frame the story how they <clears throat> wish to frame it um at the um in their newspaper 
so yeah um i hope that's really clear um in what i've talked about so basically you know um we look to the trends in the data just to sum up we look to the trends in the data and um, to kind of think about what the stories could be we then pitched uh, those trends um to journalists based on what we thought was most relevant at the time given the interest in the news cycle or the government policies etc and we pitched multiple stories so that journalists had, the journalists had a chance to um like pick which one they thought would be best and then uh yeah we managed to um secure that exclusive in the in the ft yeah that's my presentation um hopefully that was useful for everyone happy to take questions <laughs> I will move away from this uh, slide because it really <laughs> pains me still. I've been putting the cross over it. So I'll go back to the nice slide of the like, uh, <laughs> after my day game. <laughs> Thanks. <I love> that. <laughs> Thanks so much, Isaac. We have had a few questions in the chat already. So Alison has asked, did you make reference to the environmental information regulations when you were making your requests? Yes, um, we put, um, we, in our request for FOIs, I think we put, um, you know, th this may be treated as a EIR or as an FOI. So we we said, and then kind of the councils respond and be like, yeah, we're treating it as an EIR. I think when we spoke to Gareth, and uh, maybe Gareth, you can step in and say whether I'm completely wrong on this, is that it doesn't massively make a difference to us if it's treated as one or the other. So we were just like, you may want to treat this as an EIR or we're referring it as an FOI or EIR. And then the council was just like, yeah, we're taking it in this way and et cetera. So for us, it wasn't a major concern how they treated it. And yeah, I mean, uh, that's the too long didn't read. Um, you, what's they know has the ability to do both, but we kind of default to FOI because nine times out of 10, it'll get you the same information. But there are, um, we are looking into like how we promote the specific benefits of EIR for some things. Sure. Yeah, cool. Cool. Myth asked a question. I know you could probably unmute yourself, Myth, but I'm already talking, so I will say it for you. Um, <laughs> Myth asked, how did you identify which journalist to pitch to? Was it someone who'd previously written similar stories? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, a, se a slight secret is we actually pitched this to another paper originally and they said no. Um, so uh, don't have FT there. <laughs> Um, but within boundaries, so you are able to pitch marble stories, you know, you give a deadline to a journalist and say, if if you want this story, we're going to, um, this is your deadline to respond by. And if you say no, or like, don't respond, then we will pitch it to another paper. Um, we pitched based on where we thought we wanted to go, given the like reputation of the paper, to be honest. So um, we we just tried our luck. We weren't particularly, we didn't do much research on what the journalists had written before, to be honest. We 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 targeted a certain paper because we wanted to get in that paper um, because we thought it would help give us the biggest boost in terms of the story. But that would be a really, really great tip. If there's a if there's a journalist who you know is particularly interested in certain areas, absolutely pitch that journalist first because um, they're more likely to want to write about it and they're more likely to write a really good, balanced, in-depth story as well. Um, I know there's journalists on the corner, I don't mean this in any rude way, but a, a person who's writing on climate or any topic like may not know your, will well, will definitely not know your data as much as you do and may not even know much about the particular topic you're talking about. And so um, if you do ever know of a journalist or have done some research to find journalists that are particularly interested in your area, yeah, then pitch to those first. If you're going a bit more generic like we did, because we wanted to get in a certain paper then you have to make sure that obviously you're just really clear in what your data is about because there isn't going to be the level of understanding particularly about local authorities and their powers and, and stuff from national journalists um, or some some national journalists will be really good at it, not to not to tar all with the same brush but a lot of national journalists don't seem as as with the with the country don't really seem to understand what local authorities can do around climate stuff so um that was a key thing for us to make sure we did as well yeah, wouldn't it be great if the government were like clearer on what? Yeah, that's the same. exactly. <laughs> or sometimes even local authorities were clear on what they thought they could do. Yeah, that, that would also be super useful. <laughs> uh, never mind. Um, Chris has asked if you team up with a newspaper with a paywall, how else do you ensure as many people as possible can see the story online? For example, the Financial Times asks you to pay to see the content. Yes. Yeah, it's a really good question. So as well as having the exclusive in the Financial Times, 
that gives you the ability to for them to print the story first and for that to come out first we also sent out a general press release and it was covered by like other local press or and sector press as well so we had this as our exclusive but then we made sure that um <clears throat> uh, we did a general press release um so that um, other papers could pick up on it you just have to make sure that you send out that general press release after the the initial article has been published um given you don't want to um, ruin the exclusive basically awesome thank you so much we haven't got any other questions at the moment unless anyone wants to put their hand up if not we will take an eight minute break and come back at 11 o'clock for rosie's presentation okay thanks so much thank you so much isaac we are coming back so our final speaker is Rosie Taylor. Rosie is a freelance journalist who has very kindly agreed to come and talk to us about the media life cycle. Um, she works with a range of different newspapers and I'm sure she's gonna tell us all about what she does. I know she uses FOI in her work. So over to Rosie, thank you so much. Hi, thanks very much for having me. Um, I'm just gonna try and get up my slides, which is always the hairy bit. There we go, can you see? Fabulous. Right. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for having me. And um, it's, it's a real pleasure to follow on from those two excellent talks. I think Isla's done a fantastic job of showing how you can successfully pitch a news story to journalists. Um, hopefully I'm going to be able to give you a little bit more insight into that from the other side, from a journalist perspective. Um, so I'm here today to talk about the media life cycle. We're going to focus on two key aspects of that, targeting and timing. Oh, now it's not letting me, aha, here we are. So just before we start a little bit about me, uh, Jane gave me a lovely introduction then, but um, I'm a journalist. I specialize in health and consumer affairs, which is a really broad umbrella covering all sorts of subjects. Um, and I do use FOI in my work. Um, I write across all the national newspapers and I write news and features um, and outside of my journalism I do work with organisations to help them improve their media coverage um, and one of the reasons that I'm really well placed to do that is that I am a freelancer so that means every day I receive pictures with ideas some of them are database some of them are from FOIs from PRs and organisations and individual campaigning groups um, but I also have to pitch. So I pitch to editors on all the national papers. They'll all be exactly the same editors that you are pitching to and trying to get your story in front of. So I'm hoping to be able to share a few kind of insider tips as to how to get those editors to say yes when you have your fantastic FOI data and you've got a story to pitch. So what makes an editor to say yes? Um, so before I go into the details, I just wanted to make a few caveats. So the first is that um, normally when I talk on this topic, I do a, a session that's about an hour and a half and we have about 20 minutes. So I'm going to kind of whiz through. Um, this is kind of scratching the surface, but hopefully it will give you um, sort of a basic understanding of how the process works. Um, the other point that I want to make is that I am a print journalist by background. I increasingly write for online publications as well. Um, that's kind of the way of the world at the moment, but um, yeah. And so a lot of what I have to say here does actually apply to broadcast media as well and would be relevant. Um, but just to sort of say that, you know, this is my background. So I'm talking about the kind of written word media rather than broadcast. Okay, so you've got your amazing FOI data. You pulled out some really good, uh, you've done some data analysis, you've pulled out some facts and figures that you think are interesting. How are you going to get that into a national newspaper? So there are five key things to think about. Um, the first one, and I cannot stress enough how important this is, is relevance. Your story needs to be relevant to that journalist's readers. Um, and every single publication will have its own readership. Um, they all have slightly different audiences. Um, they all have unique interests and things that concern them. So anything that you can do to make your story relevant to that readership 
is fantastic. So you need to think about what interests those readers, what might be worrying them, and make your story relatable on a human level. So just going back to Isaac's talk, I thought it was really interesting that he mentioned the cost of living crisis, which is great because that is relatable to all of us. You know, that's something we can put ourselves into. We It affects everyone on an everyday basis. Um, so, and it's also um, timely, which is the second point we'll talk about in a sec. Um, but I also thought it was really interesting um, that Isaac mentioned that he pitched it as a resident. I think he said something like residents in council homes are paying more for their bills. Um, which is obviously looking at from the perspective of social housing um, residents. Um, and in pitching it to the FT, I would argue that most FT readers are not social housing residents, but they are people who are, you know, you've got investors, managers, CEOs of major organisations, and they're really interested in government policy and how it affects them, maybe how it affects properties that they own, businesses that they run. So. What was really interesting, I thought, was that although Isaac pitched that as a um, sort of focusing from the residents' perspective, the FT journalists actually turned it into like council's missing targets. So you can see how like they recognised that there was a story in there that was relevant to their readers, but they tweaked the angle slightly to sort of make it really specific to their readership. Whereas if you know that same story was covered perhaps in the mirror they might much more go for that like social housing angle you're paying more for your bills so it's just something to bear in mind because that is actually a really good way of getting data um published in a wide variety of publications you know you can take that same data and just sort of tweak the perspective that you're coming from uh, to make sure it's relevant to different readerships so the second point is does it have a hook um so ideally you would find something timely or in the news right now um, to sort of attach your story to. Um, so obviously the cost of living crisis is, is a good one. Um, topics that are being talked about loads, so I use menopause as a really good example of that. It's sort of like in the zeitgeist right now. Um, you can, and editors do say yes to stories that don't have any kind of news hook, if they're uniquely interesting enough on their own and there's no reason that they have to run at any particular time. We call that an evergreen story and Editors do like to have those sort of to, to file away for a rainy day when something falls through and they need a story at the last minute. But I would say that, especially if you have a campaign um, or kind of like policy to push, it, it's always better to find a reason, of, like a way of answering the question, why now? And in your pitch, make sure that you're really clear, like why now, why is this important? Why, why should readers care about it right now? So the third point that is really easily overlooked, I think, is ease. How easy are you making it for that editor or that journalist to say yes? Um, and basically what this comes down to is that publications are increasingly understaffed and journalists are increasingly overworked and they just simply do not have time to do the work that is required to build up a story um, in a lot of cases. So I get all sorts of pictures all the time that are kind of like, quite good there's, there's quite a good story in there but I know it will require a lot of work for me to put it together and I just never get around to doing it um so the more of a complete package that you can provide to the journalist the better so obviously you've got your data and that's a really good starting point um if you can analyze that and pull out the top lines then fantastic but it's also super helpful if you can kind of like attach relevant data sets so they've got it all there um, if you can make sure that you've lined up experts ready to talk about it, you've got a case studies to sort of um, bring out that human side of things, show a real life example of someone that's affected. If you've got that lined up and ready to go, if you make sure they've got pictures ready to go, um, all of that really, really helps a journalist say yes. Um, and my tip would be to make sure like you look at the publications that you're targeting and look at what the finished article looks like see what's on the page, um, because that is what the journalist will need in order to finish the story. So if you're aiming at kind of like a feature section or a Sunday paper or something, and they always use a picture of a case study, you know that you're probably gonna need a case study to get that through. Um, so it's just thinking, thinking ahead and trying to make things as easy as possible um, is, is really, really important. And that's certainly what I do when I'm pitching stories myself to editors. So the fourth point 
is targeting. And we'll go into this in detail now in the rest of the talk. But the key is to make sure that you're sending your pitch to the right journalist on the right section of the right publication. And Isaac did touch on this a little bit. Um, and one sort of really obvious way that you can do that is, is to actually read the publication, which astonishingly few people do. Um, so make sure you, you buy the paper or you look at the website, you look at the kind of stories that they're um, writing and you look who is covering certain topics. Um, and timing. I'm sorry, hi, it's Gemma from my society. Just to let you know, your mic's rustling a little bit. Oh, is it? So sorry. Bad. But um, it might it's be probably my scarf. scarf. Let me take it off. It might be a potential scarf. Yeah, try that. I'm sure is it's that better. It is. Yeah, <gasps> so sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. So just yeah, and the fifth point is timing, and I'm going to go to that into that in more detail now. So we're going to talk about targeting and timing. So <laughs> I get um a lot people say stuff like oh I want to see this in the Guardian or I want to see this in the mail which is great it's good to have an aspiration where you want um your why where you want your story to be published but it's also really important to realize that those publications are actually kind of made up of lots and lots of different sections that all operate differently and there's kind of no such thing as the Guardian or the mail um so let, just to give you an example Say you had a health related news, a health related story, and you wanted to get into the mail. And just as an aside, I would say, like, never write off a publication um, just because it doesn't perhaps completely echo your, your views or your politics, you know, as much as it's lovely to get stuff. Um, you know, we all like to, to have our views reflected back at us. Actually, you know, we all know that if you're trying to bring about change, which I'm sure a lot of you are, actually, we need to get stories in front of change makers and we need to make sure that we're changing the opinions of people who think differently from us. Um, and so I think it was really great that, you know, Isaac's example that he got it in front into the FT. Like, yes, the FT is behind a paywall. Yes, there's a sort of niche group of people that read that paper, but they are influential. They are change makers. So don't roll out a publication just because you know they may not be that sympathetic to say social housing residents it could still bring about change so anyway going back to targeting publication you got a health news story you want to pitch it at the mail and these are some of the ways it could appear so it could appear in a daily paper as a news story it could appear in the health features section which runs once a week on a tuesday called good health which is separate from the feature section, which runs every day, and the female feature section, which runs twice a week, which also covers health. Um, it could run in the mail on Sunday, which is a separate newspaper that only runs on the Sunday. They have their own separate health features section. They also have news pages which feature health stories. Or it could appear in mail online and they have a health section as well. And the reason I point this out is that every single one of these sections has a different editor and different journalists working for it. Every section has slightly different uh, interests, slightly different people that are kind of like targeting and also runs on a slightly different time scale. So it is really important when you look for a publication to, to sort of know the publication and to have an idea of where you're targeting, what you want your story to look like on the page. Do you want it to be a big feature double page spread? Do you mind if it's you know a few paragraphs in the news as long as it's on page two? You know, have an idea of where you want that coverage to be what you want it to look like, and then you can target appropriately. And here's just a few other things to bear in mind when you're thinking of where you want to target. So obviously, like an obvious question to ask yourself is national or local, although it is like worth bearing in mind now that a lot of local publications um, are owned by like mega groups that own like hundreds of newspapers around the country. So and they tend to syndicate coffee between each other. Um, so you may find that actually aiming for local press gets you kind of kind of national coverage because it appears in all the local papers. Um, when you're trying to target publications, you also need to think about how they're run and whether they're. Um, so, for example, are you targeting a daily paper or a Sunday paper? And if so, is that run uh, as a seven day operation or separately? So, for example, The Times and The Sunday Times. They run as two separate papers. They have separate editorial teams. 
uh, they're essentially in competition with each other. So you can't pitch the Times and the Sunday Times at the same time. They would be very annoyed. Um, whereas the Telegraph is a seven day operation. Reporters uh, work across the week. Um, so you could actually offer something to someone at the Telegraph and say, look, you can run this over the weekend any day, you know, Saturday, Sunday, whatever works for you. Um, and it's the same with online um, and, and the physical paper. Some organizations have like a combined team. So for example, the Sun is trying to do that. Um, uh, and other places are really separate still. So the Mail paper and Mail Online still have completely separate editorial teams. They are supposed to talk to each other, but they kind of don't. And this is the case with a lot of the sections, even within newspapers as well. So again, you know, going back to what I was saying just then about all the different sections within the mail, those editors don't really talk to each other. They don't communicate. Newspapers are basically not very well managed organizations and people tend to work in silos. Um, what this means from your perspective is that just because you had a no from one section of the paper does not mean you have to write off that whole publication. Like you can pitch to a different section once you've had a no. Don't pitch to multiple sections simultaneously because that can cause chaos if they all say yes. Um, but you know, if the Sunday has said no, you can pitch the daily, like it's absolutely fine. If health features have said no, you can try another, another feature section, like it's fine. Um, so yeah, just bear that in mind. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about timing your pitch. Um, so the most, like when you are sending out a pitch, um, basically what you need to do to work out when you should send it out is, is essentially work backwards. So there may be a reason you want it to appear at a certain time. Perhaps you are launching a campaign, you have an event, um, maybe there's a debate in parliament or some legislation, uh, new legislation launching. Um, you know, if you have a reason that something needs to run on a particular day, you need to work backwards from that day and make sure that you're pitching in plenty of time. Um, and don't forget to allow time for the story to be written. I think this is really important. You know, if you're launching an event tomorrow and you send me a pitch at four o'clock this afternoon, even if it's like a really great pitch, there's not very much I can do at that point. You know, you've got to give the journalist time to, to work on and write the story. Um, one thing that I would just quickly say is you, about using awareness days as a, as a news hook. Um, so online focus publications, they quite like awareness days because they tend to follow what's trending on social media and awareness days quite often trend. Um, traditional print media um, tends to hate awareness days. Um, basically, there are just so many of them. They don't view an awareness day as, an, as newsworthy in its own right. Um, and the other issue is that we tend to get pitched loads of similar stories around an awareness day. So you don't even want to know what my inbox looks right now with International Women's Day coming up next month. Um, you know, and, and it just actually, you know, you're almost better off pitching on any other time of the year apart from the awareness day. So it really depends on the publication that you're aiming for and how important it is to you that the awareness day is, is an integral part of that coverage. If it's not, then I would probably ditch it. So when you're offering your story to journalists, there are two ways of doing it. One is all round and one is an exclusive, and I'm gonna explain both of those now. So why should you pitch all round? I'm just gonna stick all of this up so that I know what I'm talking about. Right, so pitching all rounds basically means you're sending your story to multiple outlets at the same time with the aim of getting as wide coverage as possible. It's essentially casting your net really, really wide and hoping to catch a lot of fish. Um, my recommendation, if you're planning on doing this, is to always put an embargo on your, uh, on your press release. Um, that sort of helps you ensure uniform timing um, and control the release of the story. But kind of more importantly, from a journalist perspective, if you don't put an embargo on a release that has quite obviously been sent out widely, it kind of lives and dies immediately. So what I mean by that is if I get your release at four o'clock this afternoon, I haven't got time to write anything up at that point. It's not going to push... It's not a big enough breaking news story to push existing stories out of the paper. I'm just going to leave it. And as far as I'm concerned, well, it was all around. Everyone else has already seen it. So that's it. It's gone. Um, so whereas if you 
send the release to me at four o'clock this afternoon, but it's embargoed for next week. I'll sort of file that way and go, okay, great. This story's coming out next week. Something for me to work on over the next few days. So it's just really important to bear that in mind. Um, if you're putting an embargo on a story, you literally cannot make it too clear. Um, it can be in the subject line, it, in the email, on top of the press release, in big red capital letters. That is all absolutely fine. Journalists are super busy and they're always skim reading. So the clearer you can make it, the better. In terms of what time you embargo something for. So also, I just realized I haven't completely explained what an embargo is. So embargo is a date and time that limits, uh, it's like a limit on publication. So uh, newspapers or online publications or broadcast media cannot publish before that time. Um, and I think some people worry about embargoes that they will be broken, but I'd say in my experience, that just doesn't happen. Very, very occasionally it might happen because of basically cock up, excuse the language rather than conspiracy, like very occasionally, like someone just makes a genuine mistake. Um, but there's no kind of appetite among journalists to break embargoes. It's not in our interest because we know that generally we get blacklisted if we do. So you, you are like predominantly, you know, I can't think of an example where you wouldn't be safe putting an embargo on your story. In terms of the timing, yeah, there is no such thing as perfect time. It really depends where you want your story to appear. So the sort of general convention is midnight um, for print. So that means that um, the story might go on their websites at midnight. We call it 0001, so one minute past midnight. Um, and then that means it appears in the following day's papers. Um, Obviously, for broadcast, it's normally um, embargoed in time for the bulletins. Um, and for online-only publications, they really like embargoes in the middle of the day because I like to refresh their content um, in the middle of the day. Middle of the day embargo is an absolute nightmare for print. So it really <laughs> depends where you're focusing on. Um, and one thing to like really bear in mind is that an embargo is when the story will be published. So if you are putting an embargo on a story, make sure that you're available in the run up to that embargo lifting, not just after it's lifted. Um, and that means your experts and your case studies and anyone else that's sort of integral to the story is available as well. Um, so for example, I deal with a lot of stories that embargo till 0001 on Monday, which basically means they're written on Sunday and they appear in Monday's newspapers. Um, they, you know, if you are embargoing something for that date, be aware that it will be written on Sunday. At the very least, there might be some last minute questions. Um, so you do need to have someone available. And again, just make sure you're pitching in, in plenty of time to allow for writing. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute if I have time. So this is just a quick example of something that I put out using this system um, all round under embargo. Um, so it was a research into women's healthcare and how the UK compares with other countries around the world. And what I did was contact the relevant editors at, um, so they were all health news editors at national publications on the Friday beforehand. The story was embargoed Monday for Tuesday, so 0001 Tuesday. Um, I put out the full copy on Monday under that embargo. I answered questions, provided case studies, uh, extra data, whatever it is they needed. And then when the embargo lifted on at midnight on, on the one minute past midnight on the Tuesday morning. This is what appeared in the following day's papers. So we've got coverage page leaves in five national newspapers. So embargoes do work. It is, you know, putting stuff out all around can be a really good way of getting widespread coverage. Um, what I would say is, is always a gamble. So I did exactly the same thing with a, with a different story quite recently um, for Christmas. You know, use exactly the same method. And what happened on the Monday when I was getting ready to put my copy out under embargo, ready for the Tuesday, was that Rishi Sunak decided to do a massive cabinet reshuffle. Thanks, Rishi. And basically, that was it. The papers were completely full of that, and my story barely got picked up. So that is something to bear in mind. If you are sending a story out widely on a you know time for embargo, the embargo is fixed. There's, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. If something massive happens in the news to wipe out the news pages, that's it. You kind of had your chance. So that is why it can be useful to offer um, an exclusive instead. So just to explain about exclusives, exclusives, as um, sort of Isaac really explained really well just now, 
is where you work with one publication um, and you focus on getting quality coverage in that publication. Um, you can still embargo an exclusive. You can still say to that journalist, this really can't run until this time or it has to run on this day because this is when we're launching our campaign or our event. Um, you can arrange a joint exclusive. So I did one recently that was a joint print and broadcast um, and we embargoed it for 10 p.m. so it could run on Newsnight and be in the following day's papers. Um, but you just need to be really transparent if that's the case. And I think, as I mentioned, you know, if you offer an exclusive to one publication, they say, no, that's absolutely fine. Take it to another one and keep taking it to another one until someone says yes. As a freelancer, I do it all the time. You just pretend that you've offered it to them first every time. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's fine. Um, and the other thing is that offering something as an exclusive doesn't prevent you from then also putting it out widely. So yeah, as soon as it's published, and this is really, really important, as soon as it's published, you know, and that, that paper or that publication has had that exclusive, you can send it out widely to all the other press um, and, and see whether anybody else follows up. What I would say is that is this, if you are offering an exclusive, just be really, really clear in your pitch. That, that is what you are offering. Um, you know, explain that you're offering to that journalist at that publication. You know, this is a really good chance for you to explain why it's relevant to them, why it's relevant to their readers. Um, and why it's timely. Um, and again, pitch in advance to allow plenty of time. I would say probably allow more time for an exclusive. First of all, because you need, there's quite a lot of to and fro Like if you get one paper thinking about it for a few days, then coming back and saying no, and you have to pitch it to someone else, that can take quite a lot of time. But also, you know, the, the joy of an exclusive is you kind of get to work more closely with the journalist on it. So it might be that they look at your data and say, well, actually, can you have more on this? Or could we have a case study that's relevant to this? Um, you know, and if you've got the more time you've got to, to build it up, the better. So I'm aware that I'm sort of short on time. Oh, yeah. So just wanted to, to share. So this is something that I put out um, exclusively. I was offered it as a story that came from, um, I'm not sure if it's FOI data, but it came from a data analysis. Um, I was offered, I was pitched the story. I took it exclusively and then I pitched it exclusively to the observer. Um, which yeah is, is something that we do as freelancers so um, so that ran and then as soon as that uh, had been published in the Observer I also sent it out widely and then got some coverage in three other national papers so yeah I'm just going to whiz very quickly through uh, timing because I, I know I keep mentioning pitch in plenty of time um, so what is plenty of time so just to explain a little bit about how papers work. I mean, very obviously weekly papers work on a weekly cycle. I've just realized I've written Sukul there. So excuse that, excuse that terrible typo. Um, so obviously like the Sunday papers, um, they, they publish on a Sunday. All the stuff are off on Monday. So never pitch on a Monday unless you want to get into their bad books. Tuesday morning is when they pull their ideas. Most of the paper will be written by Thursday. So I would say if you're trying to pitch to a Sunday or any other kind of weekly paper, pitch a few weeks ahead. Um, it's quite hard to pitch within the week for that Sunday because a lot of it is done in advance. Um, so yeah, give yourself a few weeks. Um, daily papers, although they can turn stuff around really, really quickly on a daily basis, it tends to be the big breaking news stories that they cover in that way. So the kind of stories that you're going to be pitching FOI based stories exclusives um, you know you need to give them a bit more time they do work to a rough weekly cycle so Saturday is the biggest paper of the week they've got more space so they tend to run exclusives but they also really like lighter stories then so if you've got an FOI but you've got a really great human interest case study then that could be a good day to aim for um, Monday's paper is the smallest paper of the week but it's also the most serious um, so they tend to run drier, data-driven stories on a Monday. So that could be also a good day to aim for if you have an FOI story. The other thing to bear in mind is that most daily papers will have a skeleton staffing on Sundays. So actually it could be really grateful for your story at that point. So what I would suggest is if you have a strong FOI story, you pitch it at least a few days beforehand, maybe the Wednesday of that week or maybe the previous week and say, look, I've 
you can have this story, here is all our data, here are our experts, here is our case study. It's embargoed for Monday morning. Um, and that means that it will all be put together. It will be finished off by the staff on Sunday and it will appear in Monday's paper. And they'll be very grateful for that, I'm sure. Um, and it's exactly the same with all the sections of the paper. A lot of them run on a weekly basis, even if they're within daily papers. Um, they all have their own press deadlines. It can be very hard to sort of predict when they are. So the best bet is, again, just file to pitch them a couple of weeks ahead of when you need it to run. I've just, I realized, bombarded you with a load of quite complicated information about timing. Don't, my sort of advice would be just don't get too hung up on timing. It is, it isn't the be all and end all. Much more importantly, is making sure that you have a strong story that is relevant to that paper's readership. Um, and I've sort of said the same thing again, it must resonate with that publication's target audience, that you've pitched it to the right journalists on the right section, and that you've given them everything they need to make it easy to write. If you can tick those boxes, then you know, timing is something that journalists will just work with. And, and to be perfectly honest, if the best story in the world lands on my desk at five o'clock tonight, I probably will still make it work, but it, it would have to be the best story in the world. So yeah, don't try try not to, to send things at the last minute, but um, yeah, you know, timing, timing can help, but don't get too worried about like writing down all of these times and uh, that, I, that I've just reeled off here. Um, that was a sort of very, very quick overview of uh, just a couple of, of aspects of pitching to journalists. If you want to know more, um, I am hosting a couple of webinars next month um, and uh, they're normally 50 quid each, but to try and make it more accessible to um, charities and small organizations, I'm doing them for 15 pound a head. Um, there's one on how to pitch stories where we go into like the tricks to pitching in much more detail. And then there's another one on generating story ideas, which is sort of how to come up with uh, like ideas based on your campaigns or your policy or your organization that might get national press coverage. I think Jen's gonna send a link out to that afterwards. Um, and that's it. So yeah, feel free to, to hit me with any questions. Thank you so much, Rosie. Yes, we have a whole host of questions that have gone past in the chat. So let me just start from the top. Okay, so Myth asked to start with, is it better to pitch to a freelancer like yourself or direct to a newspaper? Not a question I might be able to answer without being biased, but um, <laughs> it's um, it really depends. Um, I would say that the benefits of pitching, well, there are multiple benefits of pitching to a freelancer. Um, one is that we have the freedom to pitch to multiple different publications. So it, we see, you know, if you come to me with an idea, I sort of know my editors on different publications and I could see, I sort of know instinctively which one it would be best for and I can try them. And if they say no, I can try someone else. And it's quite easy for me to do that because it's something I do every day. Um, another reason that is worth pitching to freelancers um, is there is this awful thing in the media industry called payment on publication, which means I am only ever paid for the work that I do once it has been published, no matter how much work I've done on it. So I have a real vested interest in making sure if I see your story and I think it's good and I've worked on it and making sure it gets published because there's absolutely no point in me doing the work if it doesn't. Um, so that's the difference from a staff journalist who has lots and lots of different things to do every day. They're dealing with the kind of daily churn editors request and they might really like your story, but there's nothing incentivizing them to make sure it appears. Um, so yeah, so I'd say those are the two benefits from using freelancers. But having said that, obviously staff journalists potentially have more weight. Um, it can be easier for them to get stuff in um but yeah they are very very busy I mean basically what I do often is act as the middleman for someone that you know they want something in the telegraph and they know that telegraph editors just never get back to them but they get back to me because they work with me so yeah this is I'm not doing a very good job of saying you shouldn't always go with the freelancer but yeah there are news agencies as well that do a similar a similar thing act as a sort of go-between 
Thank you. That is awesome. Um, Gemma has asked, how is best to pitch? Is it calling or emailing? And it's kind of linked to something Jake has said below, which is like, we're finding people don't pick up the phone. So how do you actually make those emails eye catching? Yes. I mean, so I have like a whole webinar on this, but <laughs> to answer in kind of very quickly. Um, I would say that since the pandemic, don't ever phone. There's just no point phoning. I have editors who I know on like a personal level. I've been to their weddings and I still don't cold call them with pictures. There's just no point. They're too busy. They're too short staffed. They've got too much to do. They don't have time to chat about stories. Um, and I also personally get really annoyed when people call me for the same reasons. Um, so yeah, email. People are like obsessively attached to their email. So they will see an email. It's just that they get so many of them. Um, I guess what really catches my eye in a pitch is when it obviously is tailored to me. So when it's offered as an exclusive, it's really clear from the subject heading or like the first couple of lines of the email that like, this is, this is an email for me. This is not a generic email that has gone out to everybody or just says, Hey, I think this would be great for your readers. You know, it's something that's like, Oh, hi, Rosie. I saw you've been writing about this and I've got a story that's along similar lines. You know, um, I wanted to offer you, it to you exclusively do you think that the telegraph or the times would be interested in that i know you write for them a lot you know something like that that just shows like this is personal and i always do kind of try and take the time to reply to those emails because i can see that there's been like an effort gone into personalizing it that makes a lot of sense and um, chris has asked as a non-journalist for you guys like how how much longer does it take you to do an all-rounder compared to an exclusive, like to pitch that? Because it looks like you get five articles for the same amount of work if you do the all-round, but is it actually the same amount of effort? In terms of... For you doing the writing, so like... For me doing the writing. Yeah, so if someone was coming to you with a pitch and they were saying like, I don't want this to be like an exclusive, I want it to be an all-round, like is that for you the same amount of work? So like no, what? it's probably, I, I feel like that example was a very good example. Like a lot of all around stuff is like three paragraphs. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's the same. I mean, you write one story, you just send it out all around. Um, I feel like I'm not quite understanding the question. Um, yeah, so I guess it's more about like understanding from your point of view like do you do you think about you you're thinking about you want an exclusive because that means that you kind of you can definitely get it into a paper <laughs> um you know that it's exclusive to you so no one else is going to be writing about it but for campaigners like us we might think an all-rounder is better because more coverage is better so like from your point of view if we're saying oh we're going to do this as an all-rounder is that like more work for you, less attractive than an exclusive, I guess, maybe? So for me as a freelancer, I can only cover stuff that's exclusive because my editors will never pay me for copy that they've already got in their inbox. Um, so you can send an all round to like, um, so when I have put stories out myself as all round, I've been given that story exclusively. It's just, I've then made the decision that it will probably maximize coverage if I do it all around and like I said it's always a gamble with an exclusive you will get it in one publication and then you might get follow-up which would be great you don't always with an all-rounder you're gambling on papers saying yes that day um it's like both ways are a gamble but at least with an exclusive you know that it's going to be in one publication um so yeah so so as a freelancer and sorry perhaps I didn't make that clear like I I still have to be given the, say the FOI data exclusively. And then I would make the decision as to where I publish, like whether I publish that all round or exclusive. If you wanted to send it directly to newspapers and you put it all around, that's absolutely fine. But that will be considered as a, like part of the day's churn essentially. Like, so if you're putting out an FOI about housing and there are other three other housing stories that day, you know, it may or may not make, depending on which is considered the best housing story. Um, in terms of the actual work involved, um, you know, the kind of quick turnaround stuff tends to be the stuff that's 
not delved into as deeply, but um, yeah. That's that my whole I think so. Yeah, could I just jump in from the campaigner perspective of what we th like? Okay. So we always do it both in the sense that we offer the exclusive, but knowing that we're going to send like an all round press release after that is published, because basically what we found of exclusives is that it's far less likely to be covered by a big another national paper. So if it's, you know, it was in the FT, you know, the independent's not going to cover our exclusive because it's already in the FT and they've probably like seen it, et cetera. But it doesn't mean that local press and or sector press won't pick it up, which is still really valuable for us. So that's what happened with the FT article. We basically sent out um, a similar line on the fact that councils weren't were this disparity between councils um with energy efficient requirements but it was picked up by like the building press by like the local government press like the local government chronicle but our headline was that it was in the financial times and that so we always if we have an exclusive we're always prepared to also send it out as a big like all-round press release because we think it's valuable to get that extra push even though we know it's unlikely other national papers are going to cover the same story um yeah i hope that was useful that's just cool. yeah i totally agree that that's a really good strategy um, and I would also say it doesn't, don't necessarily rule out other national papers because papers can be really funny and it's really hard to know which way they're going to go. But sometimes they all panic and think, oh my God, we've missed something. We must follow it. Why haven't we got this thing that's in the Times? And then they all panic and do the same story, which I kind of tend to exploit quite a lot, their kind of fear of missing out. Um, but, and then sometimes they get really sniffy and they're like, oh, I'm not interested in this. And it kind of depends on the publication. So like, for example, The Guardian never follows anyone else. They just don't, they seem to have a principle of not doing that. The sun and the mirror won't follow each other. You know, there's various kind of like little kind of feuds they have. But but actually quite often, especially if you get something really, you know, not to, to denigrate your story, which is fantastic on page two, but maybe if it had been on the front page of the FT, you, you might have had some follow-up in the Times and Telegraph. Like they tend to follow each other's front pages. So um, yeah, th there's definitely opportunities to follow up. Like an exclusive doesn't kill the story. Awesome. Um Gemma has asked a question that might be a little bit more involved. Um, so if we don't have time to answer it now, that is probably OK. And we can maybe follow up afterwards. Um, Gemma has asked, when you say case studies, can you give some examples when it comes to data or FOI stories? Like what would be a case study there? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I think even when you're, you know, you're dealing in data, what you're ultimately dealing with is what how normal people's lives are affected. Um, so, you know, going back to Isaac's story about residents paying more, um, you know, this big disparity in council housing, you know, it's very obvious that you could get a case study of someone who lives in social housing, who's having to pay a lot for their bills, or that their house is really energy inefficient, you know, so it's putting a human face on the data, like, um, yeah, in short. Cool, thank you. Um, so Jake has asked, some journalistic editors seem to be fine with WhatsApp. Would you recommend using WhatsApp to avoid that cold messaging or cold, uh, to avoid that cold calling? Or is cold messaging bad too, basically? Um, I personally would be really annoyed if someone WhatsApp me. But <laughs> I think it depends on the individual editor. I think the thing is that some people are like, oh yeah, DM me on Twitter. And some people like don't mind being WhatsApp and stuff, but actually like you don't know unless you have a pre-existing relationship with that journalist and they've said, yeah, just feel free to WhatsApp me, then great. Like I know the political journalists constantly WhatsApp stories to each other and people are constantly WhatsApping them secret tips and stuff and they love it. But I think just because you don't know and there's a chance that you could rub people up the wrong way, um, just email is just by far the safest medium. Um, and obviously like sometimes with, with, with people I have a pre-existing relationship with, if I haven't replied to them, I, their email they might text me or send me a whatsapp and say by the way i emailed you um that's fine but i wouldn't wouldn't cold cold approach through any other medium really other than email thank you um ranald has asked something and i'm not entirely sure i understand the question so i'm going to read it out but um ranald you might need to jump in if i haven't completely got what you mean. So Ranald asks, can you please provide some more detail on the various funding models for in-depth journalism projects, especially those where the bulk of research analysis and groundwork is outsourced or conducted by external entities rather than the journalist or their affiliated publications? 
Well, I mean, I guess the question is probably about like how big investigations happen and get funded. Um, there's basically, um, so most major investigations are sort of done and funded in house. So they, they generally are something that's kind of brainstormed internally, the, maybe the, you know, the editors have a particular interest in a subject for whatever reason. Um, and they sort of agree to, you know, uh, most of the national papers have their own investigations units or teams, um, or like they sort of like give a certain journalist some time to look into something. Um, <laughs> with the investigations that I've done as a freelancer, again, it tends to be quite collaborative. Um, you need to have a newspaper on side. If nothing else, you generally quite often need their legal team on side. Um, and then you might be working with other organizations who help you. I did quite a big investigation recently into menopause supplements not being what they claim to be. And I was kind of advised by an external party, but I had to sort of get a newspaper on board and supporting me and paying because they take time. So, you know, they need, you need a newspaper on board um, to sort of uh, fund it essentially. Uh, pay for your time and any kind of like equipment and stuff that you need so yeah um I don't think there's any sort of simple answer to the question basically there's no sort of one clear way of doing it there are other bodies like the Bureau for Investigative Journalism the various um sort of especially I think in the states there are kind of um government grants available for investigative projects some universities fund investigative projects but um yeah I, I think there's no one size fits all it really depends on what the project is 